See, by the time I was 16, 17, you know, I, I had a massive reputation in the Middlesbrough area. You know, I was an 18 stone, 17 year old kid who could fucking fight. I was running with it. You know, I was, it meant everything to me. Reputation, fear, all, it meant everything to me. You know, I'm 36 now. When I used to fight, when I, when I was pro, I was just hungry to fight. You know, you could have put King Kong in front of me and, and I battled him. You know, but now it's, it's about paper, isn't it? It's about money. I think it takes some boy to beat me. It takes some man to beat me. You know, I, I think I owe the power and the durability to be able to beat anyone. There's a lot of fighters out there. I've, I've fought a lot of fighters who've been better than me, but obviously I've just been too durable and too powerful. Close-minded individuals who are on YouTube who want to build channels off the back of other people's misery yeah. is uh, disgusting. Well, YouTube is YouTube, do you know what I mean? And people prey on that. They prey on the vulnerable. They, yeah. play, they prey on the weak, you know? And the way I was talking probably come across as a little bit of in their eyes as weak, you know, as vulnerable. To be in that, to be there watching that fight and being in the middle of it, it was, it was exciting to say the least, you know, it was brilliant, you know, it was, my heart was racing, adrenaline was pumping. It was different to 20 minutes of that fight finishing, I went on my Instagram and there was like 4,000 friend requests. Because all I wanted to do was carry a message of, 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 addiction of mental health you know because I've, I've been there you know I've, there's been times i've not wanted to live there's been times where i've overdosed there's been times where i've been in the gutter do you know what i mean with nothing you know what it's like to suffer with mental health or addiction or to be in recovery you know these are the men i worship today you know these are the men in my life who, who, who i look up to you know these guys who tell me look paul i love you i'm here for you ring and i think wow you know that's that's special that So, since we first filmed Paul Venice, must have been a year or two ago now. It, it was last July, I'll tell you when it was, it was the end of March last year, but I don't think it was released till July. Okay. So, we broke down on the way there, <laughs> and on the way back, so I hope I have better luck. Imagine being stuck with him all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was like, he was, he was just coming on YouTube then with yeah. his own channel, and loads of people since then have gone over and subscribed to Paul. They've watched his involvement in these fight situations and his profile has just risen and risen and risen. So we got Paul back to do a part two to go over more of his life story in more depth and other stories that we left out and how he's been doing since we last spoke to him. And we've got Jamie here, of course, to guide us. <laughs> so, I suppose, I'm not sure whether you want to go there, but do you want to touch briefly on uh, the end of 2021, there was a fight that went viral to millions. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. He, Let's start with so, that. he was <laughs> the 50% of the fair play guy. It did go viral, I think, two and a half million views. It made the national papers. What can you tell us about it, Paul? What was your... So, that's Decker Hagee versus Danny Christie. Yeah. And you were a fair play man. Yes. Yeah. So Danny, I was taught. How I got talking to Danny was a couple of years previous, and uh, I was I was involved before I had a YouTube channel, before I had Instagram, before I had any social media. Really, I was just sort of flicking on YouTube when I seen Danny jumping about being erratic on YouTube, and I thought, <laughs> Wow, who's this? Who's this nutter? <laughs> and, he, and 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 Danny will tell you this. You know, I love Danny. It's a he's funny my story, brother, but. <clears throat> he was made a video and I remember being sat watching it and it was uh, if any man thinks I'm lying I'll fight him and I'll do this you know and obviously Danny we know he's Danny Big Balls for a reason and uh, I says I'll fight you <laughs> I, I don't know why I don't know, if, I don't know why I said it but it was just one of them where I was just watching it thinking fucking hell who's this gobshite do you know the words were <laughs> so any man who wants to have a go have a go and you kind of just joking like it was you, you know, you went. I was eating, joking, but yeah. I was serious at the same time. But you went, you know, I'll like, have a go. I definitely would have, do you know what I mean? And I was yeah. just like, well, like I'll have a go, or whatever. <laughs> anyway, long story short, you know, me and me and Danny had a mutual friend in Gary Fairby, mm. and uh, we end up talking. And uh, Danny respectfully said, "Look, I'm no match for you, you know, but if if you want to sort it, we'll sort it." Do you know what I mean? I was just like, right. And then I said, "What's going on?" He told me what was happening and that, and then. Uh, I said, look, I apologise. I should never have fucking put it on you like that. You mm. know, I, my fault. That would do with me. I'm sorry. And he was like, ah, oh, 
no problem. I mean, we ended up talking for a long time. We didn't meet for about two years. Mm. Ended up talking and I was, you know, we used to go back and forth in messages and stuff like that. And uh, one day I got a phone call and he says, listen, he says, um, I'm fighting Decker. I want to, want you to be my fair play, man. And I was like, no problem. No problem at all. Obviously, I had, a, a, you know, a friendly relationship with Dougie anyway. Do you know what I mean? I already knew Dougie, you know, spoke to Dougie and then, um, yeah, that's how, that's how it happened. And it was mad. Man. So what, you probably didn't anticipate the amount of coverage that was going to get that fight. No, nah, well, I, I I didn't know it was going to be recorded. I didn't know it was going to be filmed. You know, most most bare fights or fights that I've been to, it's just behind closed doors and there's just you and him and you, the other guy, do you know what I mean? So obviously this was different, wasn't it? It was like, this is this is actually social media beef. And, you know, it was more than that. It was more than that. I know that now it was more than that, do you know what I mean? And, you know, seeing... Get listening to Danny and uh, he's got his reasons and you know and I, and I thought right sounds you know so I went down there with 100% backing him you know I, I w again I would never have went down there if I thought he was just going to get beat or get flattened mm -hmm. you know I wouldn't do that to a man if someone asked me to be fair play man I'd want to know can he hold his own can he fight you know does he stand a chance of winning if I think he hasn't then I wouldn't do it I wouldn't go down and back someone this guy's got to trust someone you know I just think I need to tell you now, you just, I'm not going down there with you because you're going to get flattened. Where well, I had faith in Danny, you know, I knew it was going to turn up and give it his all, you know, so, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Can I just ask you, so you were closer than anyone. So what what was your opinion on uh, the bumps and the bruises and uh, you must have felt the punches going by, the whoosh and all this. I was how, how, claret all over me. Right. I, had blood, I had blood all over me. <laughs> I had it in my mouth, in my face, in my, on my new tracksuit. Mm. I had it in my watch. Mm. I mean, it's, it's not my kind of thing, but it was a barnstormer, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it was brilliant to be in the middle of it. It was brilliant to get blood on me. I, you know, it was my world. It was, it was you know, I, without sounding like a, like a, like a brute. Neanderthal. Disgusting. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Even though you look uh, like one. <laughs> it was nice to be in there and, and be that close to it. So leading up to the fight, how much YouTube beef was there? Oh, oh shit, loads! Tremendous, yeah. Fucking mental, <laughs> absolutely mental. It'd gone on for far too long, if I'm being honest. You know, like, too <clears throat> yeah, it'd gone on for far too long. You know, and I think this this fight should have happened a year previous or even before that. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, it was uh, it was entertaining to say the least, wasn't it? You know, but when I did get to know Danny, you know, and I spoke to Decker a few times as well. Do you know what I mean? I just thought these lads need to put this to bed. You know, it needs sorting, it needs putting to bed, and it needs just over and done with. Do you know what I mean? And uh, to be in that, to be there watching that fight and being in the middle of it, it was it was exciting to say the least. You know, it was brilliant. You know, it was my heart was racing, adrenaline was pumping. It was different to see when I because I've had a load of fights myself and and I get the adrenaline pumping. It was minus the fear, so everything else. Do you know what I mean? Was just was just fantastic. <laughs> but. Uh, Again, you, you, you're concerned about your man who you're there to back, you know, like looking at him and like, at one point I says, all right, you went, fucking call him all right. I was like, oh, okay. And then I was trying to put his gum shield in and I was like stood looking at him like that and I was just thinking, like, I was just looking at him and he just went, pushed me out the way. You know, just, just went, Poof, move. I thought, right, that's good enough for me. He's, he's, uh, he's sound, you know, so yeah, brilliant. So as it started to go viral then, how did that, well, surprise well, you and impact your life well, mate when I got well, after the fight I got in the car you know I hadn't had Instagram for long and uh, pff, I had about three or four thousand friend requests mm. you know I, oh, I went, went, on, went on for a palm or didn't you yeah I had I, I had three or four uh, within 20 minutes of that fight finishing I went on my Instagram and there was like four thousand friend requests <laughs> there was like I was like what the hell's going on here? Did you have a private account before then? Yeah, yeah private. It was private. It was, I never had it open. It was just private. And I kept it private for ages. The only, the only reason I've opened it now is because I'm, I'm a, my PT trainer, you know, so yeah. it's good for business to open it and stuff. But mm -hmm. I had it closed and I was just getting bombarded and I was thinking, wow, what's this? I didn't have a YouTube channel now, did I? No. I didn't have the YouTube. I started the YouTube channel. I told you for a year to get one. Yeah. And obviously you got one. You, I don't even think you've had one 12, 12 months and it's got over 12,000. Uh, I mean, Danny's not far behind. Is he about thirty? Well, Danny's over top me. So, but getting you know. <laughs> bastard, so, bastard. So, so with a fight like that, then how do you score? Who's won? How does it work? It's it's last man standing, isn't it? Oh. It's last man standing, or the both, like they did, you know, 
shit hands. Mm. It's not like boxing points. I, I'm going to be honest. Like, they were both forced to shake hands, if, if you ask me. Yeah. You know, it was a draw. Uh, they are both forced to shake hands. I, I think both men wanted to carry on. Both, both men didn't want to shake won. hands. Both men didn't want to... Uh, no one wanted to put their hand out first. So I seen Dougie grab Deckers and I grabbed Danny's hand. Because in hindsight as well, you know, the travel down there with Danny, it was like I'd known him all my life. You know, I, I felt something special in that car with him, not in a gay way, but in a nice way, in a, brother, a brotherly way, you know, and I instantly become aware of that, you know, like I want him to win, I want him to stay safe, I don't want him to get, you know, he's getting marked up. I'm like, oh God, is he all right? You know, I could feel that happening there, you know what I mean? Not that I've got anything against Decker because I wish him all the best as well, but it was... My, my my emotions were with Danny that day, you know, and <clears throat> when that that car drive, everything down there was, was was special for us. Do you know what I mean? Special for me and him, you know. And I immediately I forgot where my point was going with that. I immediately knew that I want him to shake hands here. Mm. Like I, I want him to to just get in this car and let's you you've and everyone's respect. You've fucking fought the life the fight of your life. Do you know what I mean? It's been brilliant to watch. That's it. I'm done. Come on, shake hands. You know, and that's, I was pleased to get him in that car and we're driving home and laughing and giggling and, you know, emotions were high and, you know, it was fucking brilliant, man. And brilliant. then, so what was his first Palmo like? So, he, oh yeah, he come home and had a Palmo with me. Yeah. Well, explain what the, to the viewers what a, a, so, a Palmo is. Palmo, chicken, do you know what Sean Palmo doesn't is? know. Do you know what I know what one is. Sean's a Palmo <laughs> chicken, br chicken breast, like uh, bread crumbs. That's the original. Yeah, the original pan was. <laughs> is it got just like a shit ton of cheese on Bet top? Better on like on a plate. Yeah, yeah but it's yeah. fucking gorgeous. Yeah. So it's got like a creamy cheese. Yeah, it's and then got like your, a no, it's got your. It's like a bechamel sauce and then your cheese over the top. Mm. So when I remember Danny having a parma with us. He wanted to move to Middlesbrough, the, didn't he? The one in Carlisle. <laughs> The one in Carlisle, he says, oh, it's like a giant chicken nugget with cheese on top. <laughs> I just start yeah. laughing my head off. Yeah. <laughs> so when he got a proper palm off from yeah. down here, you know. Because he was all cut to bits and all that, wasn't oh, he? Was, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was uh, I thought he looked He looked better than he does now, to be fair. Yeah. So, so have those guys gone on to fight anybody else since then? No. Uh, I think Decker's fighting Dean. Uh, mm. Danny's fighting professional bare knuckle now. Mm. Uh, he's, I think Can he's you tell us anything big, about that? Big KFC. That's it's for Danny to tell, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So, so what about this Decker versus Dean then? Because we went and interviewed Dean with Dougie in Manchester. Yeah, and you know they come from this tradition of that, so yeah. he was very confident. What 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 do you think? Um, and Decker's saying that when he was, well, this is what I've seen. I don't know anything about fighting, but just from what I've seen, Decker's saying he was out of shape when he fought Danny. Now he's all in shape and he's going to beat Dean up and all this no, stuff. I, well, I don't know. I, is that I, just yeah. trash talk? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's, I mean, he looked well. He looked big. He looked fit. Yeah. But he might not have been, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, do you know what I mean? I'd certainly know Danny wasn't. Mm. That, Danny's words, he was on Stardog and Palmos. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He's not, he, <laughs> uh, but again, look, the both fucking brave warriors mate do you know what I mean just even to yeah. get in there yeah yeah I mean uh, a lot of pressure Danny really, done himself it? proud really proud he was a smaller man he was uh, fucking he was fucking brilliant if you ask me so being play, uh, the fair play man sorry you were present during all the training no no you're not no there was no training no <laughs> no Danny got a uh, listen Danny got a phone call saying six days to fight you in, in six days and, and lit, Danny was literally working eating palm oils and smoking weed <laughs> So, healthy mix yeah and, and for him to do to do what he did that night was fucking amazing yeah do you know what I mean it was uh, yeah it was amazing to say the least so what's the job of a fair play man well can you imagine if it was a setup? which I knew 100% of my heart that it wasn't going to be like then, someone brings a crew with them yeah so we, we we walk into we me and Danny drove to Manchester do you know what I mean into unknown territory if you like but you know, I trusted Dougie with all my heart. Like, I knew for, for a fine fact that that wasn't going to happen. And, um, but imagine if it was, you know, then your fair player man's got to deal with that. As well as Danny. I mean, we both probably would have got fucking turned over by a group of men, but we'd die fighting, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it, it's just, it's, that's as simple as that, just to make sure it's fair. You know, if anyone tries to swing a shot, that who's not involved, yeah. then you you sort them out, innit? Sort of, you know what and I mean? And is it the fair play men who decide when to stop the fight if the injuries are getting too out of control? We, yeah, yeah, I suppose I was definitely aware that, you know, if I need to be, I need to save Danny from himself, you know, because Danny is the type of man who's going out with his shield, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? He's not the man to go, I've had enough. 
that, and Decca probably isn't either. Yeah, that kind of tradition goes back hundreds, hundreds of years. To it's a traditional, long before the Queensbury rules. You know, long back in them days when there was men tight underpants stood there like that. You know, so so it's it's kind of it's part of their culture. Obviously, the travelling community. So, was there any point in the fight where you thought you might stop it? <sighs> I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Nah, there, there, there was one or two parts where I thought, oh, I kind of want this to end now. Do you know what I mean? Be- because of me caring for Danny, do you know what I mean? Again, his gum shield come out. And I bent down, I grabbed his gum shield and he was in the corner. And I, I literally was this close to him and I put his gum shield in and I'm like, got him and I'm looking in his eyes and I'm sort of like looking at him. And <clears throat> I knew in my head, therefore, ah, he's only cut, he's only bust up a little bit. Mm. He's still got a lot of fight in him because he went, move, push me. He just went, move. No, and he was hungry and I thought, yeah, he's sounding like... Do you know what I mean? And that was all I needed. Just a little act. Like, no, again, again, when the referee stops a fight, he tells you to put your hands up, tells you to walk forward. Danny was ready to, to jump over me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> to get back at it. Never mind. Like, oh no, stop me. He was fucking ready to jump over me to get to him. And that's that was the sign. I knew it was, I knew he was want, wanting to carry on. Do you know what I mean? But I was definitely aware that, you know, maybe if this carries on for another five minutes or 10 minutes, then I will definitely have the, you know, the, the courage to go in there. I've, I've seen enough of this here. So who was the ref? Mean? Who was the ref? Yeah. Me. And no, was there, Dougie, was there another one? Yeah, right yeah, in the middle, just Dougie so. Joyce. So the, so the fair play man, we're in there, we're splitting them up. You know, if, if they get too close, you split them up. So there's no actual ref? No, in... no. no ref. It's just the four people. So, there's, so there was me, I'm Danny's fair play man, and the other, the other guy was Decker's fair play so man. So there's no ref, there's just you two, and you have to decide. Yeah. So obviously he wants the best. He wants the best fair play for his man. I want the best fair play for my man. So me and him shake hands. We agree it's going to be fair play. Simple as that. So if they are tying up and they've got hold of each other, either him or me will go split up. Mm. You no, know, like our ref will go break. Yeah, that's that's what we. But do. But what if you get a rubbish fair play man? That's your point. You don't want a rubbish fair play man, <laughs> do you? I suppose you have to put a lot of trust into Dougie as well. Busted. Yeah, mm. busted. Yeah. And you know what? I, I did. I, I you know I trusted him. I trusted him. You know, I speak to Dougie, I trusted him with my life. You know, I, I I wasn't worried at all of it, of it being a setup or it being a bit dodgy. I, I just knew, I thought, we're going in here and you're getting it on. It's simple as that. That's, we knew that anyway. So you said about him, like, the shaking hands and that was a bit forced. Does that mean, like, the beef was never squashed between them then? Is it is it is there still outstanding issues? Temporary, uh, it was temporarily squashed. Temporarily but, uh, squashed. Yeah, but let me just say something about this. Um, Danny's on a, on a path of... You know, he's on his own path, he's on his own journey. He's standing attractive, he's carrying a message. You know, he's a god fearing man, he's in recovery. You know, so anything else out of that means nothing to him now. You know, so I, I don't know what path Decker's on, you know, and obviously he's got a lot of stuff going on. But I speak highly of Danny and I'll tell you exactly, Danny's path is just on a positive one. So it's Anything a negative that comes in his way is just getting battered out the way. Best you way only, to be. You only need to look at his channel to see that. Yeah. You know, if anyone calling him out or anything saying anything about him, he's not interested. So Our paths almost crossed with Danny the other day. We filmed Ricky Killeen um, up in Newcastle and he's just been with Danny and I was like, oh, because we, we previously tried to film with you and Danny, remember? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our paths... And then again, we just missed him. We were like, oh, if we'd have known he was here. Yeah. But he was already on his way back to yeah. so whatever it is he came down from. But that was a pity because we'd love to get him on, you know, at some point. Yeah. 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 Definitely. He's so, an amazing guy. Like, he's got amazing stories. So if brilliant. someone, if some absolute potato like myself <laughs> went out and said to Danny, Danny, I've had... I've won three fights out of six in the methadone clinic. I'm calling you out tonight. <laughs> He'd just laugh, wouldn't he? Yeah. Because he yeah. is people like the outsider, isn't it? There is yeah. people. It's never going to go away. No, it, it, it probably won't ever go away. But <clears throat> see, um, Danny's been introduced to to a different way of living. A different. So way you of were life. the Shane Taylor to him. So Shane obviously introduced you to. Well, I wouldn't say that. You know, I wouldn't say that. Shane, I mean, look, meeting Shane. God, God worked in Shane and changed. Obviously. I'd be instantly become open, open-minded around God mm. after I'd seen Shane. You know, maybe Danny become open-minded about a different lifestyle around recovery. You know, mm. something along them lines. But you know, Danny chose his own path. It's Danny's. It's Danny's doing. It's God's doing. It's not. It's nothing to do with me. Do you know what I mean? Danny's doing well for himself. You know yeah. What I mean? And uh, this forthcoming fight, which seems to be every time I look on YouTube, there is a big razzmatazz about it. Decker Heggy against Dean. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? It's going to happen. It's none of your uh, business. And hopefully it'll be the end of it. 
again. Um, is it ever the end? I don't know. It's that, got again, pretty again, nasty. I don't know whether it will be the end, but I think there's too much politics in, in, mm. going on. So will it will it, it be the same as Danny and Decker's? Will it kind of be the same? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine so. It's not so. I hope people, so. It's not so people can go and watch. It's going to be a private thing, is it? Oh, it'll be live streamed. Live streamed. Yeah, it'll be live streamed. There'll be footage of it. Of course, there will. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But everyone's on YouTube. Too much interest days. and money. Everyone's really, on Instagram these days, mm. so of course it's going to be viral. Do you know mm. what I mean? And I'd be I'd be gutted if it wasn't. To be fair, because yeah. I, I want to watch it. Me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not invited. I've never been. I've not been invited. Mm. So I, I, I want to watch it. They should have put it because we went the first 3D Fight Club, didn't we, Jen? Yeah. It was interesting to see how brutal that is, though, how yeah, quick it's, it's over. Just bam. Yeah. <laughs> Two minutes done, if that, yeah. a minute. And they've got the ambulance crew on standby and yeah. everything. It's a proper bare knuckle fight, and there's far and few between. Yeah. See, if you look at some decent fighters on BFBA, but BKFC is another level. You know, there's some absolutely outstanding fighters. Darren Emery, yeah. they've had him on. The guy's a fucking machine. Have you seen him in action? Not personally, no, but I followed him. You know, he's 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 a beast, man. I mean, you've, you know, you've, you've had a few offers, haven't you, to do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been I, tempted. Massively. Like, I, I want to fight again this year. Like, I want to fight again this year, whether it be bare knuckle, whether it be K1, whether it be boxing, whether it be anything. I want to compete, and I want to compete at the highest level. Mm. Have you had anyone in, uh, in the picture... So no, no, like okay. anyone and everyone. No one you want to call out today. <laughs> Darren Emery, I'm coming for you. Now, you know I mean? uh, nah, look, look, the money's right. You know, I'm 36 now. When I used to fight, when I when I was pro, I was just hungry to fight. You know, you could have put King Kong in front of me and I, and I battled him. You know, but now it's it's about paper, isn't it? It's about money. You know, I'm at an age now where the fight is really lit. I train every day. You know, I I spar with the best. I fight. I'm I'm, I'm training with the best and. You know, I could fight tomorrow if I really wanted to. How How's your body, though, compared to how it used to be? Sound. Because you, you have got a few aches and niggles, haven't you? Oh, I've had a bad back since I've been 21. You know, I may have, I've had cortisone injections in my hands. Could you well, still get to that level, though? Yeah, I think I could, yeah. I think I could. I think it, you know, it's, I think it takes some boy to beat me. It takes some man to beat me. You know, I, I think I owe the power and the durability to be able to beat anyone. There's a lot of fighters out there. I've, I've fought a lot of fighters who've been better than me, mm. but obviously I've just been too durable and too powerful. You know, that sounds a bit cringy, bigging mm. myself up like that, but it's it's a fact. You know, when I hit the top 10 rankings in Britain, mm. you know, there was lads who I was fighting who, were, who probably were better than me. Do you know that makes sense? Yeah, but, yeah. But they just... They didn't want it they, much. No, they couldn't, much. they couldn't hurt me. Do you mm. know what I mean? But when I hit them, I was hurting them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And that's what made it quite easy for me, to be fair. I mean, the last time you sat with Sean Atwood, you have kind of been on a lot of journey, and it hasn't all been good. He's had his he's had his moments where, you know, I'm not going to name people, but the more attention you get, the more negativity and trolls, and the more success yeah, you get. Well, I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to be honest with you. I wasn't prepared because, you know, I never spoke about fighting, and ne- on my channel. All I want, after the, the podcasts mm. and, you know, I started to was focus on myself. Was it a big shock myself. to you? I, yeah, it was. It fucking, it really affected me, you know, because all I wanted to do was carry a message of, of, of addiction, of mental health, you know, because I've, I've been there, you know, I've, there's been times I've not wanted to live. There's been times where I've overdosed. There's been times where mm. I've been in the fucking gutter. Do you know what I mean? Mm. With nothing. So I thought, if I openly speak about this and, and tell people what works for me, then, you know, hopefully I'll help. Mm. You know, and people... Well, YouTube is YouTube, do you know what I mean? And people prey on that. They prey on the vulnerable. They, yeah. play, they prey on the weak, you know? And the way I was talking probably come across as a little bit of, uh, in their eyes, as weak, mm-hmm. you know, as vulnerable. In my eyes, and the bravest men and the men I worship today are the men who speak, out, who speak about their emotions, who speak about, you know, what it's like to suffer with mental health or addiction or to be in recovery. You know, these are the men I worship today. You know, these are the men in my life who, who, who I look up to. You know, these guys who tell me, look, Paul, I love you, I'm here for you, ring. And I think, wow, you know, that's that's special, that. But these close-minded individuals who are on YouTube who want to build channels off the back of other people's misery yeah. is uh, disgusting. Cowardly. Cowardly. Yeah, it's bullies. Yeah. I, but again, like, e- even though I'd, I fest, I want to kill them. Yeah. You know, when I, when, I fe- when it fest started happening to me, I wanted to... I wanted to travel miles. to London, I wanted to travel to Liverpool, I wanted to travel 
anywhere and everywhere to fucking to 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 some to hurt someone. Do you know what I mean? And it affected me. I started being short with my family. You know, it was affecting my, my normal day to day living where I was like waking up in the morning and letting people live in your head when free. I was doing all that. And uh then I made a video saying, I'm gonna punch you then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look. Mm. And again, people like, ah, oh, he's a bully, look. Yeah. He's not really reinforced. His mask fell off. Yeah, he's a bully, he's reinformed mm. that for like these people calling me out then and when I when I do what I do best which is yeah. fight like and I start bringing this up then all of a sudden I'm the bully mm -hmm. what about these people who, who you know are five foot tall seven foot mm -hmm. I mean five foot tall seven seven stone ringing west sat in the city bullying me mm. because you're what? 50 mile away it's okay because Paul Venice will never find me no well it gives it, it gives the opportunity to mm -hmm. for people who are built like a Rolly mm -hmm. to be able to be a bully do you know what I mean I just think that's not fair you shouldn't be able to do that, you know. But I come back. I had a break off YouTube, and I come back, and I was a bit more accepting of it. You know, it is Prepared what it is. It. Yeah, it is what it is. You know, like these people can have an opinion or can make accusations of you. That's, that's all it is. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. They only exist if you acknowledge them. Mm. Of course, it's, it's like the gutter, show. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's very hard. I've been through it as well, well and they they, tr they, they, the they try and things. probe. Because so Jen bought me this book. What's it called? It's hunting trolls. Hunting troll hunting. trolls. Troll hunting. And they something. interview all the trolls yeah. in this book, like the most devious trolls in the world, wow. and ask them what the motivations are. And these are people who find. Um, People who've like had a somebody's died in the family and shit like that, or, and, they, and, they, and they're trolling them. Well, and they say some terrible things about his daughter. They say the the goal is to either wipe them off the internet mm. or get them to commit suicide, and that that's the mindset of these people. They're, just, they're sick individuals. They want to see sick, sickos, absolute sickos. And and but the main thing is they said we'll throw all these different accusations at these people, and the minute they react, we've got them. Minute and they'll keep probing and sending and accusing you of more and more things. And as soon as you get the reaction, they like, "We've got them." Wow, we've got them. bad that, yeah, yeah. I think what see, keeps well, you grounded is Sammy. Yeah, so that see that that's what happened. I did react. You know, I started. We've all done I started it. threatening someone, saying, "You better take that video down right now." You know, I'm going to do this and that. Demand an apology and all yeah, that. Yeah, it was, it was embarrassing. Do you know what I mean? But uh, it, but I learned. You know, it, it is what it is. Like like Jamie says, there. You know, my my wife. Uh, she's she's amazing man no she's yeah, the one she's, like why no she'll do this what are you doing she's your calm influence daft. what are you doing <laughs> like, do you know what, what I mean doing? doesn't she, matter she, calm she down saves like, you, she right. saves you yeah. and probably a lot of the people <laughs> <laughs> well that yeah. way I'd probably be doing life in jail or death yeah, mm. yeah. and that's that's probably but she has this uh, amazing ability stories. to look at and go shut up you absolute crank go get the dishes done because she's not do you know involved what I mean she's like she's I mean she's not by standard but she's involved with you but perhaps you know, mm. obviously she's not on YouTube herself, I presume. No, no, no. No, so she so can sit back and go, why are you listening to these fools? Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. when he got, to when, when, <coughs> when he got opposite the call yeah. to, uh, so some so people rang him and said, Paul, this Paul Venice, who want you to play the lead Duffy, and Sammy was like, oh, shut up, you Doyle. They're, they're having a laugh, they're winding you around. Someone lied. Do, do you know what I mean? It's like, like well, you so get she, cool. She keeps you grounded. I got I got the phone call about yeah. the, the Lee Duffy Can thing. I ask you though, when we've got the subject, what's happening with that? You tell me. Yeah. You tell me. Well, I done a, I done a, I done a, a podcast with with uh, what's it called? Stephen Rafe. Talks was it last no, night? No, Stephen Rafe. I done. Yeah. A talk, I spoke to Stephen Rafe, and he says uh, the film, the the format of the film has changed. Yeah. It's going to be a heist film, but there's going to be a character in it called the Duffer. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be based on Lee Duffy, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So it's one of them where two events do you know what based on two events or whatever do you know, some along them lines so it's still going on it's still, mm. still happening so but these kind of things take time and it's like the Paul Sykes thing now that contract got signed five years ago and people are like where's it why isn't it coming why are oh, you full of lies and, and Vaughn Civil said to me a, a couple of years back he said this is nothing in films these things take a long long time well, yeah, his uh, Jimmy Savile documentary took four years to film. It's just come out. I watched it the other week. Check it out on and the it, it's, it's really uh, on Dark. the ball, that shot. Yeah, it you is. watched it. Yeah. You know, bad. listen, he was what he was. You know, I can watch Adolf Hitler all day. Fascinated with it, but he was a monster. And uh, Jim, Jim, that Jimmy Savile thing, I've, I've watched probably about 40% of it, but you've done a tremendous job and I'd read James, anyone. James, the cameraman, structured it. Yeah. But um, but so what's your life now then, Paul? What what's Paul Venice doing today? Because you're on the BBC in the morning. You've got this new registered charity. Um, you're going to be now 
reaching out to TSA to the addicts. You're going to be working. For, I'm not going to name the name, but it's a certain certain uh, authority for kind of helping people in recovery, drug addiction, getting out of prison. So you in the, in the morning, ten past seven, and then again ten past eight. So this is the thing where we're going out, and you want to reach out to TSA, grab the addicts by the scruff of the neck, and say, listen. Don't make the stupid same mistakes I did because you've lived through it and you've been through it, and yeah. your mess is now your message. So my point, my point, that what I want, what my passion is now is, see the the fellowship that saved me from drug addiction, you know, uh, <clears throat> is is not promoted anywhere. It's attraction rather than promotion. So the way you hear about Nicox Anonymous, which is twelve step program, I mean, a lot of people hear about it from films, you know, and all that. I see them in all films all the time, but to actually know that it's in your area. You wouldn't know unless you bump into a, rev- a recovering addict, yeah. you know, or someone tells you about it. So my whole point of 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 the path that I want to go down now is I want to promote it. You know, I, it is anonymous, but I'm fine breaking my an- anonymity. Mm-hmm. You know, I can share my stuff around being in fellowship, being in recovery. I just won't share other people's. You know, like I won't say, "Oh, Joe Bloggs is in a meeting." Mm-hmm. You know, he goes, mm-hmm. "Come meet him," or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't do that, but I want to. In my eyes, I'd love for it to be taught in schools. Mm. You know, if, if if you have a family member or some addiction, this is what it does and this is what it works. You know, you treat your disease and, you know, I'd love to be able to do that. You know, so my my point being now, what I want to do is I want to, I would love to be able to, to, to have my own charity or have my own setup where, you know, we've got prisoners who get, you know, there's a lot of guys who are getting out of prison. They get £45 or £90 or whatever they get in that little brown envelope. You know, I got one. And when you leave... The lads that I that I used to see coming in and out all the time when I was in there, they would get out on the Friday, they would get the money off the off the off the prison, go straight to the pub, do what they do best, get straight on the back on the poison, and they're back in by the Monday. Do you know these guys are nobody on the streets, but the but there's somebody in there. So what I would love to do is we went and met uh the So we met the mayor of Middlesbrough. So the old point of that meeting. Lovely guy. He was a lovely guy. The Mm. the old point of that meeting was. was a great job. I wanted to see if he could put me in contact with someone where I can set up something government proved, obviously, because there will be things that need paying for, Mm. um, where we can set up a six week training program where I train these guys physically Mm. and then we speak to them mentally around addiction, mental health, diets, and diets, uh, everything, put plans in place, you know, and, and, have, and have them doing this for at least six weeks, you know, because people get out and they're going hostels. Again, hostels just the same as prison, mm. you know, there's so drugs, university addicts, the criminals. there's drugs, there's addicts, there's, you know, there's everything flying about in them places. So my, my, my point being, I would love to be able to put something in, in place for these guys or even just guys who are just on the streets and struggling with addiction, do you know what I mean? That's 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 my passion now. That's what I want to do. Fantastic. So. I mean, Sean, you do it yourself. You're going to schools, and you've had a, a shady past. <laughs> and uh, play the police. <laughs> do, do you know what? I was in a betting shop in Liverpool six months back, and uh, so I was singing, and I said, "Oh, I've got talking," and I mentioned you. I said, "I'm just around the corner," and this girl went to me. He come to my school him to talk about all these. <laughs> so that that would be brilliant because there's nothing in Middlesbrough or Teesside and even the surrounding areas. So this guy is you know, he's been through it all where, you know, he's been the kinda kinda cool guy, if you like, that the, the stupid young kids would look up to. And he's also been a ravaged drug addict, literally so weak he could hardly walk, like a head on legs, homeless. His family have turned their back on him. Nobody could trust him. Nobody would want him in the house because he'd rob him. All the, you know, listen, he's a guy who's, you know, his past, listen, I'll tell you, I've done the worst kind of things possible. My past cannot, cannot hurt me. You can't blackmail me. So he's put it out there. I probably personally wouldn't. But that's what I mean is what his kind of special power is, is his past. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of young kids in Teesside, you know, kind of, crossroads 16 17 18 that are on the verge of doing the stupid utter nonsense that the young paul venice done that if he had someone listen to him then wouldn't have to go through that and i think this is the point now where i want to get behind him 100 percent. you want to get the authorities and say there you go paul 
go out and just talk and just try and make these kids listen and see sense. I think you you do really well at school talks. I mean, I've watched a few of Sean's um, and <clears throat> as brilliant as he is. Um, <laughs> I'm trying not oh. to be rude now. Um, you're, you're a little bit younger than him. Well, um, so you might appeal a, a little background. bit more to, yeah. to the young folk. I was but, doing, I was, and you've got a completely different story. Yeah. So When I first started getting clean, I was... You no, know, I was it was two or three year clean. And I was getting invited to do a talk here, there, and everywhere, you know, and you know, try and carry a message, obviously. And uh, I was doing the youth club stuff, you know, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, these I was these kids knew me, you know, from the same area, and you know, these kids knew me, and then I knew these kids, and I was like, I'm like what? What do you want to be? What do you want to do, Jonah? You know, because this is the path you're leading. You've got no school. You've got no this. Like, what's your, what's your plans? Do you know what I mean? Because I'll tell you your plan. You know, prison death you know all that stuff is gonna if you carry on being that way take, take it from me mm. you know house is shut up and yeah like if you end up in the world's different when you're inside you know when you're in prison you think oh this is a bit different your freedom's took away you banged up 22 hours of the day you know i don't care how big an eye you are when you're behind your door you know it's fucking upsetting do you know what i mean like I'm not afraid to admit that every time my door closed for the first 10 months, I sobbed my heart out. You know, I had pictures up with my kids and my missus and all that. I would take them off, boom, boom, put them down. Then the moment I opened my eyes in the morning before my dog got up, I put them back up. And then people would come in and go, oh, are these are kids and this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then when I got banged up again, boom, down again. Do you know what I mean? And that was because I was saddened from where I was. You know, I was taken, I was, from my own, my own fault, you know, I was forcibly taken away from my family. Do you know what I mean? And I know it's it's a only fools want to be back back and forth in that place like that. Do you know what I mean? But they don't know any. Like I know I know lads who, who who've spent eight Christmases in a row in Christmas. You know they get out, then they go back in, back out in, back out in. I'm thinking, like, what are you doing? They're like three meals, roof over my head, and I'm thinking, wow, that's sad. You know that's rough. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've done two Christmases in there, fucking cry my eyes out. It was horrendous. Christmas was mint. I love Christmas as well, and it brought me. It really did. Mm. But, but one another thing you said, Paul. I always remember every time you had a visit, ruined your day. Yeah. So the only time, the only ever time I got violent in prison was after a visit. See, most people get excited by them. Yeah. So I, I did. I, I actually did get excited. But then when I'm when the visit ends and I'm walking back to my wing, you know, I, I realise you know <laughs> you're in here for another eighteen months, mate. You know, you're only going to get to see her once a week, your kids once a week. You know, my, my, son, my, 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 my son didn't... No, I, I was I, once a week. A visit? Yeah. All right, okay, it's changed. I was a good prisoner, Jamie. It's changed in the... Mm -hmm. I was a good prisoner. But your, your, get, son, your son had, had his first palmo when you were away. Yeah, I was in jail. That's had a his big first thing for middle of people. Had his, no, I sent me a picture saying your son's had his first palmo, my little ginger bull, and he was there <laughs> eating his palmo, and I remember looking at it like, and I was padded up with someone at this time. And I just looked at this picture and I started crying and he just looked at me like that and I went, just looked at him like I went, don't you dare tell anyone I'm crying. He went, oh. <laughs> he went to water and good. I was just looking at the picture, sobbed me out. I was thinking, oh yeah. my God. What is it with a motherfucking Palmo? Well, do you know what? We can change that tonight. The, we can change that they tonight. Are, they, mate, they, they are a proper Middlesbrough thing. Like they are. Do you know what? Every boxing contest I've read, I was eight stone. And then all of a sudden, I got addicted. It was Palmo. <laughs> let, let me just say something now, right? I never read a Palmo in my fight camp, ever. Cr Crystal I meth couldn't. users will never understand the withdrawals from the Palmo. So there you go. <laughs> How long do you go without one? Uh, so you start cracking. I probably have one twice a week. But I've had, I've had a habit sometimes when I've had them like, oh, I don't even want... You, you've been bad on them, haven't you? Yeah. I, still <laughs> have. I know people in Middlesbrough. Three or four, four times a week for, I have for one. breakfast, what? you know what I mean? It's like Three or four times a week we have Palmos. Yeah. I'm on a Palmo tonight. You know, and there's vegan palmos, there's all this kind of thing. A vegan but one, there it's, you it's, go. it's a big, big thing in Teesside. It's part of like, it's like, you know, pie and mash to the Cockney. Jelly deals 100 years ago. You know, everyone would eat jelly deals in, in London because everyone was poor. So they went to the Thames and it was crawling with eels. So catch your net and you could feed your family for a week on them. So that was why it's a cockney thing, pie and mash. And in Middlesbrough, it's the palmo. It's like yeah, curry with piss head. Seriously. <laughs> so have you spoken in schools yet, Paul? Well, no. So I, years ago, before I met Jamie, I got offered to go into uh, my daughter's school. And my daughter's 18 now. Well, Home House reached out to us, yeah. Palace Park Community Centre, and 
Middlesbrough College, but also we spoke to um, the the mayor the other week. So I'm putting this in in process. Who uh, so we're going to be talking to? I was there last week at a place called Recovery Connections, uh, and they're so eager to speak to him because he's lived it. You know, you might be at a talk or, but you know, listen. If <clears throat> I mean, I, I've been, I've been in a, a naughty boy school in Thornaby and a bad boy school in Peterley with someone else I don't want to mention, and a lot of the kids. They looked up on him and all the parole officers and probation officers, everything that they said, they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when this person went in, kind of a bit like Paul's life, it, they listened. Do you know what I mean? We had about 40, 50 kids sat there. Then we were getting messages on the night saying, oh, thank you. So and so, my son has is went home and he's reading the book and he's following all this. So imagine what he can do to the thousands on T cells. Oh, it'd be massive, yeah. Definitely. So the teachers, you got to contact like the PSHE teachers and the citizenship teachers because mm. they're in charge of addiction and drugs education. Mm-hmm. They're the ones just reach out to the local schools in, for those teachers. Yeah, yeah, I just think I, I would I would I would love to do it because I remember when I was trying to get clean, you know, and you're speaking to drug workers and you know. I, probation officers and all this stuff and you and they're trying to you can see they're trying to understand and or, or they've, they've been to university and done uh drug counseling and whatever and you're looking at them and I, I i used to always ask them you ever took drugs no what the fuck do you know what i'm going through then please tell me have you ever smoked crack no go you know because i when i met someone out of fellowship and they sat and said and i always remember i used to say to him you don't understand he goes excuse me i think i fucking do you know, I don't don't forget. I was on crack for ten years. I was on. What was the other thing you were on as I well? Right, and really, yeah. Oh God, so, so now that ruined track. my life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you were locked up, weren't you? I was on that every day for about four or five years. Mm. Holy shit! It's every disgusting. Day. You every day. Oh, and and, and yeah. it, the weirdest thing was when I went to prison. I remember saying to my last. I think I said this last time, didn't I? I, said, mm. I remember saying to my last. That was a mad year, wasn't it? And she come to visit me. She went, yeah. She went, how old do you think you are? I was like, 19, 20. She went. You're fucking 23. I was like, what? Lost three oh, years of your I life. Just, my head had just gone. I, 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 I was on it every day for five years. Oh, when I, my head, when I was when I landed in prison, I thought, fuck me, that was a mad year. It was just like three or four years, five years, gone. Did you start it when it was legal? Yes. Mm. Yes. Did you start it in prison? No. I, I, okay. No, it was before. So I remember being about 18, 19, and... Uh, my life was just starting to go on. See, by the time I was 16, 17, you know, I, I had a massive reputation in the Middlesbrough area. You know, I was an 18 stone, 17 year old kid who could fucking fight. You know, and it was, I was running with it. You know, I was, it meant everything to me. Reputation, fear, all, it meant everything to me. And I would have fucking done anything to keep it that way. With that lifestyle came come a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have been doing, to be fair. Do you know what I mean? And, drugs everything and uh it fucking um, it, it killed it killed man and sammy's relationship it it killed my relationship with the kids you know it it was it started to fucking kill me you know it started to deteriorate me you know and by the time i was 18 19 you know i was fucking shadowing myself absolute shadowing myself like jamie said i was a head on legs you know i went from 17 18 stone lifting weights a big scary kid to just 14 stone just looking like that my head was the same size by the way big head big chin <laughs> and I was just on this little tiny body just running around like a fucking idiot so what did you think when you looked in the mirror I fucking hate myself but uh, but when I was when I looked in the mirror and seen it, I was on drugs mm. I mean one of the most crazy uh, stories I loved it one of the reasons it's funny it's a good it's a good thing Tell you asked there because story. the reason one of the reasons why I always took it every day was because when I wasn't on it and I looked at myself I think oh what have I done mm. do you know what I mean but then as soon as I'd have it again I'd be like ah fucking look somewhere <sighs> you, no, no, mm. because that's exactly how it was. You know, like I used to, I used to. No, my dad used to call me. Wow. No offense, Telly. I love Telly Stockwell. He used to call me Telly Stockwell. <laughs> and Telly was one of Lee Duffy's best mates. He was yeah. close, but he's built so like he a. Ca- he's kind of like, like a racing snake. The brother-in-law. And, he, and uh, dad said, "Son, you look like Terry Stockwell." And, and basically, Lee would kind of, you know, grab him. And make him do buckets till he turn green or yeah, yeah. Oh. make him smoke crack with him, do you know what I mean? So Terry had kind of no limits. And uh funny enough, it was it was Lee's son, his only biological son, he said to me, told me the the most famous story. He said, I was joining the army and he said, I was in the barbers on the I think the barbers you go to on the Monby Road. And he said, So I was just going to the army 
and I seen Paul and I went, all right, Paul. And he said he was like a lat and he kept coming in, in and out five times. And the barber said, he says, and then Michael was saying, what's he doing him? He said, he's been doing it all day, just walking in, awesome. scratching himself. Just, you know, so he was this kid who once upon a time everyone feared, who now the only place he's gone is a proper loony bin. This podcast is sponsored by Harry's. Harry's is way more than a super sharp razor company. They're here to revamp your whole routine, from close shaves and flake-free hair, all the way to clear, healthy skin. Harry's helps guys feel great. For this sponsorship, Harry's is offering a free travel-sized shower gel with a trial set. To you, the viewers, to give you a chance to try their other products as well as shave. Please make sure to support this podcast and give your own shower shave a go by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to have your set delivered and start a shave plan. Your freebie will be added at checkout. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting Harry's. Link is in the description box below this video. Doesn't even know what he's doing. He, he was that, just that far gone in the head. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get, I got sectioned for a week. I got, no, I think it was 14 days I got sectioned mm. for. I was, uh, I mean, that's a, an I'd amazing been, story in itself. I'd been awake six days, you know, I was fucking sleep deprivation, drug mm. psychosis, my mm. head was fucking gone. You know, and uh, started tripping. Apart from that, you're all right. <laughs> see, see, apart from that, I was all right. But but it was gone. It was well and truly gone. Do you know what I mean? And when I got sectioned, it was like I'd been to sleep. They put me to sleep, and then I'd woke up, and I was still tripping for a full week. Were you, you know? hallucinating? Yeah. Well, I just my head was gone. Do you know what I mean? Like there was people there, weren't there, speaking to me, asking mm. for fags, and I'm sw- punching them. And, <laughs> You know, and and, and but then I, I, re- in, yeah. I start, <laughs> started realizing like these people aren't here. You know, and they were like, "Give a fuck, give a fuck, give a fuck." That was weird. It was proper weird. It was hard to explain. So and you that- still remember it? Oh yeah, day. yeah, yeah. So I, when when these there was this guy who kept asking me for fags, and I knew he wasn't real. <laughs> so when people were asking these nurses and people and doctors and that were saying, "You're right, Paul," I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." And when they were turning the back, I'm going mm, swinging at him, <laughs> and I'm hitting him. He's falling over. <laughs> so they went. <laughs> Later on the day, they went, are you all right, Paul? I went, yeah, yeah, I'm sound. They went, can you just step in our office a minute? I went, yeah, yeah, sound. She went, so you're not tripping or anything like that? I went, no, no, I think sound. They went, can you just have to tell us what you're doing there then, mate? <laughs> I'm fucking swinging in fresh air. Swinging it was like a scene in Fight Club. <laughs> I, was, I was swinging punches in fresh air. I was like, wow. And they're like, look, is he still here? And I just burst crying. I says, yeah, he's behind me. He's, he's, asking, he's asking for fucking bags. I haven't got none. Oh, and they were like, he's, oh, he's in his head saying, you need to do a book of Jimmy Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> so they, start, they started up on my medication, started giving me a load of different stuff. And he just disappeared, didn't he? And then he, got, he went after a couple of days and then when I, I, yeah, did listen you miss to him? I did actually yeah <laughs> so I, I, you know I, I remember listening to this so I remember getting out right and they give me this medication which was uh, one in ten people suffer with side effects from it and it was voluntary muscle spasms right so I fucking know, it was horrendous I was fucking gutted so I was uh, watching you being framed with all my pals come round fucking hell what are you playing at you're you alright and all that I was like yeah yeah you're back so on the sesh sat, no no I was sat with all my lads sat with all my pals and we're watching you being framed. We had a couple of joints and that. And I'm sat watching you being framed. And uh, I was still taking this medication. You know, they said, keep on that for a good few weeks. I started laughing at you being framed. Next thing you know, my face fell. My All, all my toes tensed up. My legs tensed up. Muscles in, in my body started tensing up that I didn't know I had. I swear to you, my face went, my lips went up. My, all my side <laughs> of my face come down. I looked like Quasimodo. <laughs> So, and I got stuck like this. Oh, my face was stuck. Is that when your limbs started going? Yeah, everything? I was on the floor going, ah, and all my, all my mates are laughing. Like, what are you doing? And they're all laughing. They're laughing like you've been framed. They're laughing at me. And I'm like, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. They're you like, be, no way. I'm, I wish I had a bit about, I'd have been like, you too. So, so I'm, I'm, I was proper stuck. I don't, I think at the time, there was only motor rollers at the time. Yeah. Okay, I made some feel old. So I was stuck. Like, all my muscles were stuck and I'm seized up. And I was like, but my face was like, oh, they're all looking at me laughing. Mate, my face was still like that for three days. I, had, I, had go, I went to the doctor's like this. <laughs> and I, put, I had my hood up like that and the doctor went, well, can we show us what's happening then? So I pulled me, <laughs> up, I pulled my face down and I'm like, oh. He went, 
We don't have to start laughing. That's that. Well, don't fucking laugh. Just don't you fucking laugh. You know, I was, oh. I was, I was proper panicking, thinking that I was going to be stuck like this forever. You know, like my face and all I'd, that. I didn't make a YouTube everyone, famous. Everyone was laughing. You know, like, even my mum was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, look at my face was stuck like this. Oh. But it was hurting me as well. So he was like, what, what have you been taking? So I went, these have been taking these and that. He went, ah. One in, one in ten people suffer with voluntary muscle, sp muscle spasms. I'm like, yeah, fucking me. You'd have to come to my elbows. So he gave me these muscles, these muscle relaxants. Crushed them up. He said, you should be all right in ten minutes. He said, go wait in the waiting room. So I'm all up again. Loads of people out. And I'm sat in the waiting room like that with my hood up. IRA mask on. Next thing you know, I, th I remember pulling my hood down. I looked at him. I went, wow. <laughs> you right now? I went, get me home. I was like, fuck hell. Did you ever watch you being framed again? <laughs> no. No, <laughs> oh, but it was it, it was fucking scary because I just thought, oh, I, I remember driving in the car going, I'm going to be stuck like this forever. Do you know when my funny is? Well, you drove like that. Oh, man was driving me to, to, to the doctors. Now I'm stuck like this with my face. And she's looking at me going... One of my funniest Paul, Paul oh. Venice stories was there's a boxing promoter, a good friend of ours, Tony Robbo, what man has mentioned him. And uh, so he'd been trying to track Paul down, saying, Paul, I've got a fight for you. Where have you been? So basically got him after you know days of trying to find him. He's like six months on the crack I was. He's like, Where have you been? He found I've me got in a fight for you, yeah. Are you scared of something? And Paul's like, No, no, no. I've been in a crack house for three days. So that so was, was kinda accepted it was alright. He was like, Oh, I'll have a fight. And Tony looked at him, he's like, Shut up, you can't you can't fight. I was you know? meant to be fighting that super heavyweight. No, the lad, the lad <laughs> I was fighting was because I was a super heavyweight before yeah. that gone on the crack. I think now and you were about a like middleweight or he something. Was fucking <laughs> arms, what he, I'm fucking piping away and he says, Are you fucking fighting next week? What are you doing? I've been trying to go. He went, Yeah, yeah, I'm sound. I'm sound. He went, Where are you? I went, Should the crack house will be all right? He went, Fuck sake, put the phone down. Yeah. Tony done the fight. Tony ended up having to step in and fight this, this fucking big lad. He got, got beat. He got me. beat as well, yeah. <laughs> and he always used to say to me, Fucking you, you little bastard. I used to yeah. know. So, how were you on the come down from crack? I never felt a come down. I used to stay, stay awake till I collapsed. Mm. Wow. Like literally, I would be smoking pipes and shutting tablets down my throat. And you know, you never done it a kind of bareback. You never just went crack. It was always Valium and all that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like I always ups and downs as I mixed it all and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? I was just, oh, I was crazy. I, I guess. Listen, the reason why we, I'm glad we can laugh and joke about it now. Yeah, I was just going to. I really say am that. glad because you know, in hindsight, I shouldn't be alive. I yeah. shouldn't be here. You know, I, I always remember a time. It's too extreme, wasn't it? Yeah, like. Look, I got to, this, we're laughing and giggling about it now, which I'm happy for, I'm glad I can, you know, but there was a time where it took me to a place of not wanting to be no more. You know, I felt such, such, such a failure. You know, I had two beautiful kids at the time, you know, a beautiful missus who stuck by me since we've been 14 year old. You and you haven't I mean? deserved it really, have Nah, you? And, and I always remember one the time. Child, Sammy. I was Sammy. I always remember one time I was driving home and I was walking home and it was just starting to get light. The beds were out. I'd been awake four days. I had eight ball of crack in my sock and eight ball of coke in my other sock. And I had about 40, 50 Valium in my pocket. And I had a bottle of fucking Bella. And Bella Brusco. Yeah, two litre. I remember walking. Classy thought, guy. She doesn't let me in here. Because she used to always go, fuck off. You know, get her in. Go to your mum's. No, get my head down. And she would never let me in my, while I was out my nut. So I thought, she doesn't let me in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself. I've had enough. She wouldn't let me in. <laughs> But I didn't say, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to kill myself. She wouldn't let me in. I said, listen, you need to let me in. She was like, nah, go away. My kids are in here. You know, she was a proper good mum. She said, go away. You're not coming in here where my kids are. Go away. So I was like, right, no worries. I walked into an abandoned house, an old house. South Bank. South Bank, yeah. Ate the crack. Ate the cork. Ate it? Et, yeah. Just, but I think it still had plastic on it. Ate the oh. fucking plastic, swallowed it. Ate every single tablet I had in my pocket. And drank it. And I always remember, like, just sat there, drink neck in this Bella, and I felt myself fading away. And I knew I was dying. In my head, I thought, I'm dying here. Like, this is it, I'm done now, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm, I'm done. And I felt myself sliding away, sliding away, boom, I was out. And I woke up about 16, 17 hours later in this house, and I thought, eh, how the fuck am I still alive here? Do you know what I mean? And I was a bit good. I was a bit good to be alive. I was a bit good to be waking up, because I felt such a fucking failure. You know, and it, it was disgusting the person I'd become, the things I'd done. You know, the way I took drugs was fucking very selfish. Do you know what I mean? But I, I know now that it's a selfish disease that I suffer with. Mm. You know, this disease of addiction. You know, and for me to be able to, to talk about something like that and, and, and sit here and tell you, listen, I want to live. 
you know, I want to live, I have a good life, I'm happy with my life. I think you know, one thing days. you want to get across, it wasn't your kids that saved you, it wasn't a good woman, it listen, wasn't your parents, I, it was any. No, listen, I've stepped over my kids to take drugs. If you would have asked me while I was on a sesh for three or four days, do you love your kids? I said, fucking right, I would have died for them. And I meant that, I would have. Mm. You know, I would have fucking, I'd take a bullet for them. If someone would have asked me to stop taking drugs and go home to them, I couldn't have done it. Mm. I'd have just stood there crying, taking drugs. I've done it many as times. You know, I would stand there crying, saying I'm shit, dad, taking drugs. You know, and I, 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 even I didn't get it at the time. Why can you go home? Like, what the fuck's up here? Your kid's there, do you know what I mean? Was there a battle with your mind between the two? Of course it was, of course it was. I know now that I was born with this. I was born with obsessive and compulsive disorder, which is not to clean, not to do anything like that, but to change the way I feel. You know, I've been addicted to many things and I still am. You know, I, everything I do is to an obsession. Trainers. Gym, trainers, clothes, watches, everything I do to is to an obsession. You know, and anything that made me feel good about myself, um, I latched onto and it kicked the ass out of me. Drugs, fucking every, anything that changed the way I felt, I latched onto. Now, I work a programme I work on my head, I treat my head, you know, and it helps me stay focused on the things that'll keep me alive, <laughs> not the things that'll fucking kill me, you know, hence the reason why I stay clean on a day-to-day -day basis. So how long have you been clean for? Oh, well, I was, I was seven years clean, eight months ago I had a little hiccup, and uh, I ended up relapsing, but that's fine, you know, it, it, that is fine, do you know what, that is totally fine, because... I, I remember talking yeah. about Alex Reed about what any, he said. Any relapse that I survive, is, it was meant for me. Do you know what I mean? It's meant for me. I've seen so many people in recovery over the ten years that I've been in recovery um, go out for one more like one more use and never make it back. Mm. You know, I've watched watched people who've been 10, 15 years clean and sober, you know, and go out for one last use and never come back. You know, end up dead. You know, so the relapse that I had, very, very grateful for. Which is sounds weird because, you know, I wish it never happened. Of course I do. But I'm still grateful for it because Imagine that's, I was. Imagine it happens when I'm forty or when I'm fifty. You know, I, there's ones where I might not ever survive them. You know, but they only make us stronger. You know, I know what I need to focus. I know where I slipped. You know, I, I wasn't working a program hard enough, and that's probably why I realised. I was going to say, was there a trigger? I use because I'm happy. I use because I'm sad. I use because everything's all right. I'll be used because everything's fucked up. That's the way the UK works with alcohol. Exactly it the same. It is. Well, celebrate, alcohol's a drug. drink. Alcohol's a drug. Sad drink. Yeah. Well, exactly. It's the worst out there. In my yeah, opinion. of course it is. But what makes it worse is it's illegal. It's mm. legal. That's what makes it worse. I remember yeah. telling Alex Reid about it and he said, you know what, Jamie? Because we were all concerned and worried about you. And he reached out and he said, you know what? He's going to feel like crap. But he said, this is going to do him good because he's still here. And he, he's, he is going to wake up and for a week he's going to hate himself. And I mean, I didn't see you for that time, but am I right in saying that's what, exactly what happened? Yeah. Yeah, of course it was. You wake up and you think, fuck, what have I done? You know, and then you're suicidal again. You're right back at the step. You're right back where you left off from seven years ago, from when I was clean, when I walk, worked the programme. But, you know, straight after, you know what needs to be done. You're straight back on the horse. You get you carry on riding. You're back into recovery. You're yeah, back to being your sponsor. You know, and just for a day, no one cares what happened yesterday. Okay, no, I'm not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Today. It's yeah, all it's all, it's all in control, decision. you know. I mean, do you get the mindset um, of the creepy voice that comes through quite frequently to sort of encourage you to use again? So the creepy voice is actually disguised in my voice, in my head. Mm. And that's what's scary because, you know, this voice that goes, nah, that's a good idea, that Paul, go do it. You know, it tends to be my voice. So I think, that yeah, must be a good idea, that's me talking there. <laughs> but it's not, it's it's... You know, the ability I have now is to be able to go, hold on a minute, first thought, second thought, third thought. You know, my chain, my, 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 my way of thinking slightly changes, but it all happens in a split second. You know, so I can go, I feel like punching him right now. But then, I, then my second thought will go, don't do that. Then my third thought will go, be glad you never done that. Then my fourth thought going, well done, Paul. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, it, it's given me the ability to be able to realise, you know what, conscience again as well do you know what i mean like i'd probably feel bad now if i chin someone yeah. you know i'd probably feel bad now if i if i strangled someone or i'd probably f I, I would feel bad if i used or done something disloyal or bad do you know what i mean you know and that's one thing i never had you know i never had a conscience i never had guilt i never so had got shame. more empathy now yes i never had anything you know i never felt anything in anyone apart from my wife and kids maybe do you know what i mean but other than that i was just ran by anger and fear you know my fear kept me dangerous my anger made me act on that 
fear. You know, when I felt fear, I got angry. It was the only emotion I knew how to express, really. Do you know what I mean? Sean, so can I, I ask you a question? So when you come back to Britain and you were like, oh, my God, I've been to the... I'm a devil. I'm going to come back, rehabilitate. Put I'm my, a devil? Put my parents through. No, obviously... what, <laughs> you, what the prosecutor what, said. What, what, <laughs> you did, what you did, you know, you, you wanted to say, right, I've done this. I want to prove I'm not a piece of crap who's poison society so you had a lot of making up to do but was there any times when you when you know you didn't have the devil you didn't have the voice you had wild man going come on la let's get on it was there any times when you you had your mate and you were like oh just as a one-off or was it just zero i think the swat team coming and thinking i was a wild and crazy party person mm. and then going in the because jail because you were around wild man who drank for, he never gave up drinking because you didn't give up alcohol as soon as you moved back. In the, in, the, in the jail, the whole day sadly revolved around getting the heroin in. Do you not drink like Sean? Sorry, no, I've no. never really drank. So 90% of the prisoners approximately were injecting. So I thought I was a wild and crazy party person. I was hardcore. And now I'm with people who are 10 times more hardcore than me. So that was the wake-up call I needed because I didn't see how long that road of drug use is. When I was doing drugs for over 10 years, it scrambled my decision-making processes. And I thought I was just keeping the party going. But those fellas in the jail were at the end of the road of drug use. About two-thirds of them had hepatitis C from showing needles and yellow jaundice skin and teeth rotting out. And I was thinking, fucking hell, do I want to keep going down that road of drug use and, and, and join these guys? Because this is hardcore. Yeah. Or do I want to, is this, do I want to stop here where I am now and get off that road and seeing how drugs had affected those people because they knew they were dying from hepatitis C. Mm. But all the day revolved around was just getting in. It was like slow suicide. They, they knew they were killing themselves and they couldn't stop. That's exactly what addiction is. So, addiction is definitely, sorry, Sean, addiction. Yes, okay. it, it, I always learned now, right? Addiction is slow suicide. You yeah, know, it, it 100%. <clears throat> no, I, I always remember someone saying to me, listen, this disease will kill you, Paul. 100%. He says, listen, if some, if you were dying of cancer and someone a doctor says to you, listen, go to a meeting for one hour on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or Sunday. Just for one hour. Just go. He says, and you'll live a long, happy life. That's you treating your cancer. Would you go? I says, yes. He went, start going to meetings and treat your fucking disease. <laughs> he says, you'll live a long, happy life. And that's what I did. You know, and this recovery treats my disease of addiction, you know, the same way as chemotherapy would treat cancer. You know that that's that's so how you're it, still going now. Yeah, but but yeah. but once you've acknowledged, we'll probably go a bit more. If my sponsor will probably watch this and kick me up the ass. <laughs> yeah, I will start going tomorrow, mate. I promise. Once you've acknowledged though that you've got the addiction, which I did then once I was in the jail, I realised yeah. it. I didn't realise it before that. I didn't understand it. Then you got to go inside yourself, haven't you, yeah. and address the root causes of why you're doing it in the first place. Because until you until you do that, you're never going to stop. Now, well, I found out now, right? Drugs aren't the problem. No, any of the addiction that I have is not the fucking problem. It's this. I was always told, listen, Paul, your head wants you dead. And I thought, wow, does he? And then the more, more I look back over my life, it fucking definitely does. You know, the way I think now, still, like, if someone popped my head up and they seen the way I think on a daily basis, they would run a fucking mouth. They would never speak to me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and I think, because my first thought is always fucking horrendous. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like bad. And then, but then that, again, when I, when I speak to them, when I tell you how my, my thinking pattern goes, you know, that tends to like even itself out and I become a good person. You know, someone always says to me, look, Paul, you aren't you thinking, so don't worry about it. Because I remember sitting in the meetings going, fucking hell, I keep thinking dead negative. I keep want to, I want to do something bad. I want to do, you no, know, like, it's just in me. That's how my brain thinks. And he went, well, you're not, you thinking. I went, how's that work out? He goes, well, you haven't done it. You're still here. You know, you've been thinking like this for the last few months and have you acted on it? I went, no. He went, so you aren't you thinking. I thought, well, I like the sound of that. So I kind of aren't, do you know what I mean? So as I started to work the program more, I started to realise these sayings that people were saying to me, you know, you're dead once you're dead, you know, this, that, the other. I thought, I was actually born with this fucking sick brain where, you know, Russell Brand, he done a documentary on it where he tried to prove that you're actually born with a disease of addiction, you know, so you can't help it. You know, and he'd done brain scans, he was doing MRI scans on addicts and non-addicts. And there's a part of the brain that never stops lighting up. And that's the feel-good bit. You know, that switch-off bit. You know, if you go to the gym, you feel fucking great. Do you know what I mean? When you walk out, I get a feeling of when I finish at the gym, I sort of stop. And I think, you haven't done enough. Go back, go back, 
go back and I have to like oh I need to go home do you know what I mean and that's and that's how my head thinks constantly around everything everything do you know what I mean like and that's obsessive did you say earlier? yes of course it is obsessive yeah. it's obsessive I've only got two feet I have a thousand pair of trainers <laughs> some I'll never probably wear because of the prices and all that and I'll wear. it's just fucking crazy so how, how have you learned to manage it then Buy less shoes. No. Well, yeah. <laughs> Buying trainers is not going to kill me. It, it'll still cause friction me, with my wife at home because she'll go, oh, another pair of trainers, have you? I'll go, no, I've had them ages. She goes, stop fucking lying. <laughs> Do you like hide the boxes on the way I in? I get them delivered to my mum's now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, I edit that bit out. <laughs> no, but I get... Uh, the way I treat that now is... The recovery, Sean. Do you know what I mean? I I, I accept now. Uh, like I, I know when I'm when I'm being obsessive or I'm being compulsive. You know, I, I've learnt now. I've got enough in my little toolbox now from recovery and from NA to know. Like, well, hold on a minute. You know, you, you're being obsessive here. You're being compulsive here. You know, so most days I can recognise it and think you've done enough. Fucking go on. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you put a circuit breaker in. Yes. The brain. Yes. When I when I when I first found the gym, when I first started training, you know, um, I think I was sixteen, seventeen. My dad was a bodybuilder. I started training. I was literally training three, four, five times a day. You know what I mean? Eating food, training. Blah, blah, blah. Took it to again and to another obsession. Do you know what I'm saying? And it was just, fuck. You forget. Like, my obsession will make me forget that I've got a wife and kids at home. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's how bad it gets. Do you know what I mean? Like, even trainers. Like, I'm not a millionaire. I don't have a lot of money. Do you know what I mean? Samuel will go, oh, can I? We need this. Can I buy this? I'll go, no. And then a pair of trainers will come two days later and she'll go, how much of them? And I'll go, ah. Oh, 50 well. quid. Yeah. <laughs> and she'll go, oh, hold on a minute. He said, I couldn't buy that, but you fucking buy that. Boom, then it becomes a problem. Do you know what I mean? So why do you think, do you think your first thought is your negative thought? It's not always that way, but, but nine times out of 10 it is. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why. You know, I, you got to remember, before I open my eyes and wake up, my disease of addiction has done a thousand press-ups and a thousand sit-ups waiting for me to open my eyes. Do you know but what I mean? So when I wake up, your I'll Your first go. thought was violence. Because you come yeah. from South Bank. Yeah. So it's if someone's so going to disrespect you, it's... it's... Mate, listen, trauma as a child, the stuff that I suffered from, do you know what I mean? No, like, you know, I was... I shared it on the last podcast. I was badly yeah. beaten when I was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, by a man who was probably going to... He probably would have killed me if I didn't get away. Um, bullying. I got bullied bad. Uh, I was overweight. You know, I've seen things that I shouldn't have from my parents. Do you so know what I mean? So with building blocks yeah. towards... I mean, my parents today are absolutely the best people you ever meet. Born again Christians, working class, brilliant, brilliant people. But they weren't always that. Do you know what I mean? With the, with the, with the similar lifestyle to how, how I lived. Do you know what I mean? I've seen it. I witnessed everything with them too. You know, and uh, I was well loved, don't get me wrong. I think... But I think... being protected from certain stuff that, child shouldn't, that children shouldn't see, I wasn't. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I think, Sean, if, if Lee, Lee Duffy was the fighting man of South Bank, Paul's mum was the fighting woman of South Bank. So she was... Yeah, sure, that's true. You know, it's kind of... Paul, I mean, I've met his dad. So you can tell, looking in his eyes, he's just a lovely, lovely man. Whereas mum, I think whatever he's ever got, whether it be an addiction or whether he's kind of fighting ability, has only come from <laughs> only come from your mum, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've never seen my dad have a fight. He was a big, massive man who'd done yeah. the doors. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas my mum was always fighting. Yeah. i see my mum had loads. Have you? Oh, yeah. What was the first one you can remember? So a, a girl... I was. I remember this girl. We were in a club, we were in a pub, and uh, I was only little. And there was one stool that span round. No, the the, the head of it span round. It's like you could twist yourself like this chair. So I thought I want that stool. And I was only a child. So I, thought, I thought I want that stool. And she got off it. So I thought yes. So I ran over, grabbed the stool, sat on it. She come over and went, "That's my chair." I went, "No, it's not." She went, "It is my chair." I went, "Go away." I was only a kid. So the woman come over, wallop. Hey, mum, come over. Big, this fucking big bed. Come over, slap me off the stool. Get off. Our mum's obviously, well, yeah, what's going on? I'm crying. She, my mum's went over and this woman just went to grab our mum's hair. Our mum just went, whoosh. Mm. Absolutely smashed the bed in. South Bank kiss. Yeah, but she wasn't, she wasn't, uh, you know, you see women fight or whatever, they pull hair and all that. Mm. My mum wasn't that. She was, she, her in. hands like man. <laughs> she just go smash, smash, smash straight away. This yeah. woman was in a heap of blood on the floor. Mm. I was like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> How to be, old were you? To, to be fair, though. Young, I was only young. To, yeah. to be fair. I need, to, Thomas, to, I need to say this, Jimmy, because obviously my mum is a proper lovely woman. Mm. She's honestly, Sean, if, if he's ever met her, you would think, no way, that's not that. Much. But years ago, she was. you know. But now she's Christian. She's she's 
she's ran nursing home. She's NVQ level five. She works in a church. Fucking brilliant, absolutely brilliant woman. But we all have passed on me. And when I when I was brought up around, my mum always says to me when I started making a name for myself and becoming a fighting person and building a reputation for me, she went, "Are you frightened?" I went, "Yeah." She went, "That's why I never lost a fight because I was always too frightened." Mm. And that was my mum who said that to me. She went, "Keep hold of that fear. Don't ever lose it." I never lost a fight because I was too afraid. And that again, when I turned professional, went in the fight game, I would always be in the tr in the in the in the uh, changing rooms, sat waiting to go in this fight. And this fear that I used to feel, it was enough to cripple a man. You know, fight or flight. Do you know what I mean? And I know this fear. I know it. But I was so driven by it, so driven by it. And everything my mum had always um, them words that my mum always says to me never left me. Every single fight, I always sat in them changing rooms thinking, "Whoa, I'm going to kill someone here because of this." What I felt. So is your mum your biggest fan? Yeah. She never watched me fight, ever. Oh. She doesn't want you fighting. Or no, she never back. ever watched me fight. She never, she, all she used to do was sit at home and wait for a phone call. My dad never missed a fight. Was always there. My dad was always, used to, I used to show him who you're fighting, so I show him, you got you kill him. You'll knock him. I you're suppose it's dad. mother's instinct. You don't really want to see a son. Yeah, my mum never blood. wanted to see me fight or anything like that. My dad was, you know, I'm, I, I was the best fighter in the world in my dad's eyes. Do you know what I mean? Do you know, I've just, I'm just doing a book now, which is out next week, and it's called Hartlepool, Our Town. So I've had to interview Philly Tobin, Algie Hay, Mick Sorby, guest of yours. Uh, so I, I interviewed uh, Philly Tobin and, and his missus, Christine, and I said, we know Paul Venice. I said, no, no, you don't. I said, do you do? I said, uh, little fat kid, ginger. I said, no, no, it's not like that now. He looks like that. So I rang Paul. I said, Paul, did you have a Man United top years ago? Yeah, yeah. So this, they said basically he was a little fat kid crying. So Paul basically spent his childhood just crying. <laughs> In this little man you uh, shirt. Man you know, top as well. Do you know when I was, see, when you, when you get into, when I got into recovery and started doing the work on myself, starting to realise, you know what, something not, something's not right in there for me. I started to realise that as a child, I thought about death. You know, I thought I looked in the mirror, didn't like what I seen. You know, I was a fucking good footballer. I was good at all sports that I did. I was fucking great at all sports that I did. I played hockey, I played cricket, I played football, I swam, I done everything. And I was good at most things. I was good at football anyway. And uh, yeah, when I used to go home and look in the mirror, I hated what I seen. I felt fat, I felt too ginger, you know, and I constantly thought about what it'd be like to die, what it'd be like not to be here. Do you know what I mean? And looking back at that, I don't think any, any kid should be thinking like that. Do you know what I mean? And that was another proof for me that you know, I definitely wasn't born properly. I mean, born properly. I definitely was. I was born with this, this, this mental health disease that I have that I suffer with. You know, it was. I was born with it, hundred percent. Do you know what I mean? And, and more that I've learned and met people in recovery, they have. You know, they said, "Look, my childhood wasn't right." You know, I, I remember being a child and feeling different, not feeling like I fit in and all that. I thought, "Wow, that's how I felt." Do you know what I mean? That's exactly. You know and. And that's how this program works. You know, you always look for the similarities and not the differences. And you'll find that all these people in these rooms are, are from all different types, of, not this room, from in the recovery room. You know, they're all different types of people from all different walks of life. But they have one thing in common, and that's this, this disease of addiction. You know, these people who I've met in these rooms, you know, I probably wouldn't have given them time of the day if it wasn't for any. Do you know what I mean? Because we've got nothing, you know, from different different places different walks of life but yet we're sat in these rooms and you know he's talking about his drug use or he's talking about how his head fucks him over or he's talking about his mental health or his depression or his, and i'm thinking fuck this is these are like these are living in my head here mm. do you know what i mean and that's the beauty of it that's the beauty of it so at the minute we're um in the infantry of getting your charity up being his voice so what's the name behind that paul and how far what, what do you want to achieve by doing it <clears throat> so Obviously, my, my little princess, my little girl, you know, since while I've been recovering, and, you know, I've been living a good life. Me and my she's wife just had gone four now. another band. She's four next week. Oh, okay. So we had another little girl. Uh, <clears throat> I nearly said sadly there, but she, no, it's not sad at all. She's she's un unbelievably brilliant. She's autistic, non-verbal. At first, it was sad because of the difference and, and all that stuff. And I was thinking, well, what, how and why? You know, and I'm the type of person that, I want to know why. I want to know how, you know, conspiracy and all that stuff. I can fall down a few rabbit holes and all that. But I'm, I'm not thick. I'm not stupid. Do you know what I mean? I know what, what, uh, I know what type of conspiracy I want to listen to and what, what type of, is a, as a possibility of being real than true. So when I was looking at this autism stuff, you know, I started to find that 
you know, it was depressing me. It was making me really down because I wanted someone to blame. I wanted to, to grab hold of someone and go, why have you give her this? That's what's making her autistic. You know, none of that bullshit. It's in my gene. It's chromosomes I'm meeting. None of that shite. I don't listen to that. You know, she was perfectly fine when she was born. Clapping hands, look, making eye contact. Now all of a sudden she's not. And it really, really took over my life for the first year where I, I wanted to rage war against anyone and everyone who had to anything to do with NHS or any government or anything like that. My wife says to me, listen, you're doing all this and it's fucking running your day. It, would you change her? If there was a cure, would you change her? I went, no. She went, well, fucking stop it. Hmm. And I thought, wow, she's fucking right. Why so that? I'm at peace with it. I'm at peace with it. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Absolutely brilliant. But it's given me another another subject to focus on, which is autism awareness. You know, I, I talk to a lot of parents and a lot of people on Instagram and around YouTube about autism, you know, because I've got so much to learn. You know, there's so many people out there now that I didn't realise how big autism was. Didn't realise how big it was. When I f first heard of autism, I pictured Rain Man. You know the film Rain Man where he's counting cards and Tom Cruise and all that? That was my first encounter with autism. I didn't know it existed in Middlesbrough area and stuff like that. I didn't, I didn't know. Everyone has a family member or a friend who is autistic. Everyone. And I was like, wow, why, how? This is off it. But these are so unbelievably unique. I mean, Alex you know, Reid was diagnosed last year. Well, uh, yeah, well, he's on the spectrum as well. But I found that, like, you no, know, there was a lot of stuff that was getting said, you know, these kids don't need to prepare for the world. The world needs to prepare for these kids. You know, they are so unique and special. Like, it's it's unbelievable. So it gave me the, it gave me the drive to start doing something for my daughter's school. You know, these autistic kids, you know, I, I wanted to start my own charity up. Next thing you know, someone messaged me off Instagram, uh, says, oh, Vienna's Voice. This is a good name for you. That's and I, brilliant. And I, I absolutely loved it. Yeah. I was like, wow, you know, my, my daughter's non-verbal. She might never ever talk. You know, and I thought, wow, I love that. Yeah. I can't find this person who sent me the message and I, I've, I've made videos so about it. it's just it. a fan. It was just someone messaged me, yeah. Just someone says, oh, Vienna's voice it's for your really charity. It's kind of powerful. And, and, and I've, yeah. I've mentioned it a few times on my YouTube. And, 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 and They deserve credit. I yeah, they definitely that. do. I'd love them to be a part of it. Yeah. And uh, what gave me the idea was when I started going live on YouTube and talking about uh, mental health, addiction, autism, you know, people started sending money. And I was like, whoa, stop, stop donating. I didn't want that. Yeah. You know, because what the message I was carrying was given to me freely. Yeah. And it's free to you guys, so stop sending money. But I wouldn't stop. I kept sending money. I was like, oh, holy shit. You know, I was speaking to my sponsor about it. He went, look, you know, force no one to send you money, but it is a non-profit fellowship. So I was like, shit, what am I going to do? So I started giving it to my daughter's school. Is that Daisy you know, Chain? Yeah, uh, wait, no, you give the book to Daisy because, Chain. No, well, your book. Obviously, yeah. I've written it. The book's a very South Bank story. Clues in the name. Yes, it's Paul's words. I've been addicted to phone, but it's kind of the Lee Duffy book from a South Bank point of view. A lot of people who I would have reached out at, they went, Jimmy Boyle, shut up, look at the, look at you there, do one. But because Paul is kind of South Bank and he's accepted and he's one of them, so that's what it was. But basically, each sale, that book supports Daisy Chain. But Which is my, an autism charity. <clears throat> but my, my next charity, well, in fact, most of my, every, my books now, Brian Clough next year, Jack the Ripper, so they're both going to support the Frankie Lee Boo Fund um, and Daisy Chain. Not Daisy Chain, sorry. The Vienna's Voice. Yeah. So I'm going to be behind it. I'm going to be in London nine weeks from now. I'm going to be sleeping rough for a week. I'm going to be lending Paul's clothes to fit the part. I'm going to go <laughs> I'm going to be going unshaven and everything. Um, but do you know what? It's just all about making a, a noise. You know, yes, I can play the clown. But do you know what? It's a smoke screen to say... Yes, Paul's going to be out helping the people, but also he's going to be helping the children at Teesside with autism. I don't know a great deal about, but I want to be involved. See, what what I was saying was when they, with these people sending the money and that, I started giving it to the daughter, to my daughter's school because they're going through a big move. They're actually moving moving buildings, and uh, they were struggling. And uh, so I, I still give I still give them to every month. Do you know what I mean? First times I was going live. I was doing big money. There were, there were, you know, people were sending a lot of money. So I was giving them, like, I give them a thousand quid, then I give them 700, then I give them eight. You know, I was like, fucking hell. Then I got knocked off my perch with, a few, you know, with the trolls and all that. So I come oh, off it. You know, they were saying, they ah, fake, yeah. fake fucking Christian, fake yeah. K1 fighter. Mm. He's keeping all the money. He's this, that, the other. Thought, he bought his belt. Know. He invented him. <laughs> so I started getting a lot of shit. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? You just can fuck off. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I went to the school and said, look, I'm coming off YouTube that I'm getting trolled. Is it that bad? Is that the reason why you did it? Yeah. Do you yeah. know how many other YouTubers have said the same thing? 
that they've shut down their charity because of trolls. Mm. Yeah. How no, I didn't is. know. I didn't know. Lots. But but again, so I never ex- I never ever once accepted money on Vienna's Voice. I never. But I spoke highly about it because I'm, that is my is my passion. It's not set up yet, but it's in the it's in the process of getting set up. I've made this clear to everyone that listen, I have never once asked anyone for any money or set anything up. People have messaged me and says, look, we want to send some money for, for the school or for charity. And I've said, listen, charity's not run up yet, but every penny that you send goes to the school. And that's what I was doing. You know, so, but then people go, ah, his charity's not set up. He's a fake ass bastard. He hasn't set it up. Fuck it. I, I've never once said it is set up. Yeah. It is getting set up. You know, and once it's up and running, it is going to be a proper, you know, non-profitable charity where we're going to be doing things for these artists. Not only that, I'm going to try and put it together where we do the mental health and the addiction in with this charity. Mm-hmm. You know, so. I think yeah. everything that you're going to be involved with is positive. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. you know, it's just every single move he does now. You know, yes, I know who Paul Venice was. <clears throat> I didn't know him then. I'd heard of him. But I know what he was about, you know. And and, pe- and most people do. But that was then. This is now, you know. And I, Tell I just, me one person on YouTube who doesn't have fucking history. I couldn't. Doesn't have a past. No. Exactly. Mm. So point proven. You know. Exactly. I mean, Sean's been torn to shreds. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very careful for work with now, but for the last two and a half years, I've worked with Sean pretty closely. And I, I'm i very careful with who I get into bed with. I'll keep, I'll, I'll keep that secret safe, Sean. <laughs> I've heard about you and all that. And uh, But but you know what? He's he's someone, who, and he's like, Paul's the same. My, my, my business partner, Rob Brenton, Paul Sugar, and I've got a handful of people who I'd work with. I wouldn't even have to, you know. My wife fell in love with him a couple of years back, and... You know, that's why I want to proudly get involved with stuff and think, do you know what? That'll do for me. You know, end of this year, I've got 25 books out. So there's 100 books in me. So probably 50 of them books will be involved with Vienna's Voice. Because when I do the stars, that's their own book. But certainly the books that I write off my own back, I'm going to be like, right, Vienna's Voice, Frank Leibu, fun forever. Because it's, you know, listen, I've been, I've been involved with a lot of bad guys uh, and people say, oh, you're writing books about monsters. It shouldn't be allowed. You're a disgrace. You shouldn't be on YouTube. Hang on, I've paid thousands of pounds to, to register charities. So a lot of my work does go to great causes. But as soon as, as soon as I found out about it, I just thought, do you know what? I want to be a part of that. Um, so that's that. Fabulous. Before we uh, go, you've got a hell of a lot of uh, creatures on your leg. It looks like a bush truck like trial. You look like being... I'm he's a new David Can Ambra? you point the camera at that? At his leg? You can see it all. Yeah. I didn't have one when I last one. Last met you. didn't have one? <laughs> so why the bugs? Because he's addicted. Yeah. No, I've but, had the tattoos. I never had one uh, nine months ago. Because you've got a centipede, spider, I want to say a moth, butterfly. Uh, that is a, a, a dead-head moth. Fuck cockroaches, uh, scorpion. Um, tarantula I mean, just got the ladybirds keep going uh, black widow uh, grasshopper I mean they're not very cute and fluffy no yeah but look no. at him <laughs> I know I am I am cockroach is very fitting <laughs> do you know what it wasn't even my idea whose was it the tattoo artist and you just said you roll with it yeah but go I mean, they're pretty cool. your arms and all that because you've yeah, got your kids so, on and all that uh, my daughter my fighting career autism uh, my hand wrap where you get your hand wrapped um I've got my ring walk on my wrist as well. And uh, there's me, that's me ring walk. Mm. Oh, Dreamer, cool. that's where they used to go when that used to land. Um, again, jigsaw pieces, that's my wife. Mm. Me daughter's on my shoulder, me son's on my back. My life, my strength, my power. The reason why I fought. And then, again... Jamie Boyle next hammer. week. <laughs> uh, that's DLVS, Demi Lee, Demi, Lennox, Vienna, Sammy. Yeah, the rest is just fucking... Whatever. And you're just going to keep going or you're going to wrap it in now? Because no, your parents are just like, oh wait, I've Paul, be here. I've got my chest done. I've got symmetrical patterns on my chest. I've got my fighting name on my belly, which was the menace, mm. which I'm, it's half done, so I won't get that out because it looks a bit of a mess, but it was too painful. No, it wasn't really her. <laughs> but that, that hurts fucking bad. It's where I had to go, yeah, stop, leave it. Really? Um, yeah. 
Okay, no, I was getting two at a time. I was getting that one and my belly done at the same time. So I know people who were like, does it hurt? And they're like, no, shut up. Oh, of course it With the big does. ad, Paul yeah. Venice. is like, oh, no, stop. <laughs> no, it stings. It's horrible. After the se- two-hour period, you are I do six absolute- hours. Oh, sod that. So when I get tat- every tattoo I've had has been fucking excruciating. Mm. But I'm there every Wednesday. Mm. And I will continue to so be there Sean, Wednesday. any questions for Mr. Venice? No, I just, you just got a pure heart, man. And you don't need to explain yourself to any of these dickheads uh, at all. I mean, this one, I knew, <clears throat> I knew Paul's first part. So today, um, I just wanted to direct very, very differently. We started off something which was completely different, which was massive on the end of, the end of last year. And obviously we went down a dark path. But do you know what? His story is so thought-provoking. It's so... Do you know what? There's so many people, and I'm admin on his page, and there's so many people reach out and they're like, oh, Paul, because of you, I've been eight days clean because of you. And I'm reading it like, he's an absolute knob. But but what he's doing and what he's... But the people out there, I mean, I know him and he's just... He's just Paul to me. But, you know, I've got to... I've got to look at him as the world looks at him, and I really take my hat off to him. My 14 year old son uh, really looked up to him, and I don't have any, I don't have any any problem with Jameson, Jameson Lennon, named after, named after Neil Lennon. But uh, do you know what? I don't have any problem looking up to him, and I know there's a lot of people in Teesside that, are, and it's not because who were once upon a time what he was, it's who he's going to be for the next 20 years. Well, I mean, apart from Vienna's voice, what other. Exciting stuff. So what have you got going on? Yeah. Uh, Obviously, I'm working a lot now. I'm PT level three. I'm personal trainer. uh, Striking coach. uh, What does that entail? Just teaching people MMA, teaching people how to Mm. kick, how to punch, you know, get fit, lose weight, gain weight, whatever whatever they want to do. You know, obviously, I've got the experience around putting weight on, losing weight. Uh, I've been a bodybuilder. I've been fit for fights, you know, so I've... We've got a lot up there. Um, I'm getting offered a lot of fights this this year. Uh, Do you ever think I'm going to fight? You are. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, prefer, I want Sammy to get on board, you know. But I need to. I need to give it a go. I need to give Why it not? one last. Do go. you think? Go I mean, do you, you know, because someone like me, I'd be like, "Whoa, this is great. We can do everything." <laughs> but I mean, for people out there watching this, you know. You've been on other podcasts. Your first podcast has nearly been on 150,000. So for people watching this, how can they get in touch with Paul Venice? Instagram. Don't message me on Facebook because I don't go on there. Although uh, you have got a Facebook page called oh. Paul Venice Actor, which is run by me and you. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably get the messages. Yeah, yeah. Then Jamie lets me know. But yeah. Instagram is the only... You are on Twitter as well. Yeah, Twitter as well. <laughs> At Paul Venice Free. Instagram's nice and easy and simple for me. So that's why I, I, I tell everyone to message mm. me on there. Paul Venice 22, just well, message me on there. Paul Venice Actor like Facebook, at Paul Venice Free Twitter, Instagram, and you've got your own YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, YouTube, Paul Venice Kill. Uh, so he's on He's on the four platforms. In fact, he's on TikTok. Oh, yeah, I'm on TikTok now. Oh, you're a so, TikToker. You know, I'm singing and dancing on TikTok yeah. now. No, yeah. no, not really. <laughs> so, I, just, I just lift weights on there. Or, but, do you know what? Oh, you want to know? They're all platforms <laughs> to possible, you know, they're open doors to prisons, schools, youth clubs. You know, it's basically a, a well when it's, it's Nanny's closet to more positive stuff. You know, listen, if you're getting bullied and you're into the old life, don't bother messaging Paul because he's had that as well. Um, you know, he doesn't get involved. You know, doesn't like people being bullied and I'm sure he could probably give you a little advice. But um, that kind of past life is where it belongs. The clues in the name, it's in his past. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just now he wants to... I, I sometimes look at him and I think... And he says to me, I've seen that message and I'm like, I'm surprised you're surprised because there's people out there who don't see a way out, who, you know, who were, and even worse to where he was when he tried to kill himself. So for him to reach out to Paul, it, it's like, he would never have thought of that 15 years ago. Do, you know, so it's a sign of the times and it is, you know, it's powerful and social media is a huge tool. And basically he gets messages from all over the world and um, it's all for the right reasons. That's fantastic. 
So 100%. please go down in the description box and support what Paul's doing, especially Vienna's voice. Like almost 10 years ago, my sister, her little kid had leukemia and went through chemotherapy. And then more recently, she's been diagnosed as autistic and epileptic. And in recent months, my sister was crossing the road and the kid threw herself under a London bus and almost got run over. So I know how that affects a family. So it's, you know, it's very important that people support what Paul is doing at Vienna's Voice. And if you want personal training as well, or if you want to be taught how to punch can and I just kick say, and... <laughs> Can I just say a big, lessons. A, a big, big thank you also to Mr. Sean Atwood, because two months ago, when he was up at this neck of the woods, uh, he donated off, I don't know, two boxes, of 80, 100 books of Sean's book. What was it? Hard Time. Yeah, and uh, basically, um, all proceeds are going to be going to Vienna's Voice. So that was very, very yeah, kind thank of you yeah. for that, Sean. You're Although, welcome. my wife's not pleased because they've been in my kitchen. I'm up here now and I'm going to get them. Yeah, and she, for, for every day for the last two months, the wife, Mrs. Boyle, has been like, isn't he coming around here? I'm sick of that Paul Venice. Don't have him near my door, Jimmy. I, I regret the day he ever come around my house. When I see him, I'm going to slap. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. But no, very, very kind of you, Sean. Um, yeah, appreciate and that. you know what well, you know i don't know what they're going to be done they'll be raffled off they'll be sold um i've given him a few alan thompson books which they're still there and uh you know do you know what they're, they're going to go to a good cause so thank mm. you definitely yeah. thank you. I can't wait to watch you fight i know i'll I send you a few it. links later james wants to be your fair play woman can i she <laughs> oh, yeah. just wants a palm oil tonight <laughs> we've got to film jen, jen having a palm oil. Oh, i will, I will eat a palm oil. you'll see her next palm year palm she'll be on and she'll be like the size of me <laughs> 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 the jamie boyle diet <laughs> Gadfly Press is proud to announce the publication of Big Joe Egan, the toughest white man on the planet. And that statement came from none other than Mike Tyson, who wrote the introduction to the book. If you want to check it out, the link is in the description box below the video. It's got almost five stars on Amazon, and it is mind-blowing stories of Joe's rise in boxing. You've got the crime story of what went down at the pub, the war at the pub, Joe's incarceration, and how the toughest white man on the planet could not be held down, how he rebuilt his life. He's gone from strength to strength, and what he's, you know, you can see right now what he's doing all over the world. So links will be in the description box below the video. Thanks for watching. And if you want to see the full podcast, it's on our channel now. In which he talks about Michael Francis, Tyson, and loads of big names that he's worked with. Fascinating stories. Check it out. So the book, Big Joe Egan, Toughest White Man on the Planet, is available in all three formats, audio, ebook, and paperback, worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organiccottonclothing.co.uk